Next to Grace is Vidisha Mishra. Vidisha, when you're introducing yourself, same question. If you are the president, uh, you are to, to be a president, what country would you want to be president of? And what would be the first mandate um, you'd want to tackle? And then next to me right here, this incredible la lady that's laughing, <laughs> who is laughing as she's re reflecting on the elections in Kenya um, this week. This is um, Nanjira Sambuli. Um, and same question to you, president, what country, um, what would you be tackling? And to our further, to my further right, is the only the talking gentleman on the panel um this is um ephraim kenyanito same question to you all right we're going to start directly with grace grace karibu sana if you were president of what country what would you be tackling uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening everyone i am really uh, privileged to be here i uh, I, th I, I, uh, I don't know how to thank you enough so if I were a president, which country? Uganda, of course. There we go. Patriotism. <laughs> Patriotism, but also it's a place where I know best. I have uh, been all over the world uh, for education, but I have always felt like a foreign student, a visiting fellow, a, a researcher. And, but in Uganda, I feel at home. And for me, I believe that uh, the place where you know best is the place where you can suggest uh, solutions is a place where you can modify, is a place where you can, um, you can mobilize uh, supporters. Perfect. So in, in Uganda, I will start with empowering women. So that's, because th that's this, it, that's the full yes. stop. Thank empowering you. women. Yes. Perfect, <laughs> going directly into the conversation today. Vidisha, over to you. Um, I, I'm nervous to follow that up because my answer is quite silly, really. Um, it would be the US, mainly because I have an Indian passport and I do not want to go through the visa process. Um, <laughs> also, uh, we've seen that literally anyone can do that job, so. Wow. Oh. Hey, shade. Shade from DC to Kabul. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, can, can it be repeated? Go for it. Uh, just that literally anyone can do that job, so. There we go. From, from, uh, yes. Wow. Donald, yeah, Donald. He's left behind, that's legacy. All right, over to you, over to you, um, Nanjira. I, I had a very different answer until Videsha did, so I would say, Chief Colonizer, United Kingdom, <laughs> for the same reasons. <laughs> there we go. Ephraim, I, how do you end? I would end similar to Grace, Kenya, because I know Kenya best. And what I'd tackle is the culture of corruption. Oh, yes. There we go. Culture yeah. of corruption. So I did read an, an article a few years back that there was a research done, and they're trying to understand uh, youth of, uh, what the youth of Kenya thought about corruption. And 95% said that, that you can't live without it. It's a rite of passage. So that, that tells you about what Ephraim wants to tackle. It's, it's a thing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our conversation today, we're going to be talking about the great gender regress. And I'd just like to let you know that this is going to be a conversation. So at any one point, if you do have a question and something that you want to interject, you just write it down and be ready to um, comment later. Um, but what we want to do is keep this pr as practical as possible um, to give you some actionable points that you can go back to your workplace or home with, but really reflect points that can t take us forward, right? Um, now, I'm just going to start by lead reading a quote from the former president of Malawi. This is none other than Joyce Banda. She says, leaders are born, yet many born female in rural parts of sub-Saharan sub Africa go unrecognized largely because from day to day, women and girls face political, cultural, and social environments that inhibit their development into well-equipped female leaders. I'm going to read that again. Leaders are born, yet many born female in rural parts of sub-Saharan Africa go unrecognized largely because from day to day, women and girls face political, cultural, and social environments that prohibit their development into well-equipped female leaders. And I want to start with this because whenever we have the gender conversation, it sometimes becomes a cliche because we have it um, on every conference, on every, there's gotta be that talking panel that talks about gender to a point that it becomes a monotonous conversation. So the 
the question is how do we how do we approach it such that we can have um, uh, we can trigger different thought and be able to move forward rather than have the same conversation over and over again. So I'm going to start with you directly, um, Madam Okello. Um, when it comes to women um, in the context of political leadership, right? Um, while women are increasingly exercising their right to political participation, many who aspire to political office still find their, their ways barred by gender norms that see polit politics as a masculine space. So the formal, rules, the formal rules that discourage women's equal participation in politics have slowly eliminated um, in this 20th and 21st century, yet the informal norms are still largely at play, right? Um, we find that women political leaders have been forced to play by the rules of the patriarchal system that does not allow them to hold true to, true to the feminist principles that put them there in the first place. So the situation on the ground for the girl child largely remains the same. Right? So now the question is, how can or should we rethink addressing the regressive norms that hinder the transformative role that women political leaders can play in advancing gender equality? <laughs> that's, a, that's a handful, but I'll, I'll, I'll go step by step because I'm a teacher and I teach uh, in the medical faculty. What we do best is start from the known and go to the unknown. So first at the early childhood, what we do normally is to socialize girls differently. We, we tell them you can be a housewife, you can be a nurse, you can be, you can be a secretary. And, and in fact, even the type of education that you offer them, the teachers that train them, the churches, I, I, got, I went to church uh, uh, in early childhood, like I depended on it. Okay, so these are institutions which uh, work to shape not only men, but also women. And uh, in, my, um, in my class, I can tell you that in the last eight years, in the medical faculty, there is no class which I taught where there is over 10% women. This academic year, I am teaching uh, a class where there are only four women out of 90 students. And these are future doctors. And this is the trend. So what, comes, what, what happens in between there? Is it only the socialization process and the training? Is it also about women making choices? Because I believe women also have the capacity to make choices. And, 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 and if they make a choice to not go for sciences, please let's respect them. I am fed up of this idea whereby women are pushed to directions they don't want. I want to, to, to interact with women who have made choices and who have decided on several paths. But now, if they choose to go into politics, what is there and what should they expect? Going into positions of authority, you're going into positions of leadership, you're going into very busy, busy assignments. Eh? Don't go there and want to wave the feminine card. First of all, be sure of what you're going for. Eh? And then when you reach there, please deliver. I always have a, a challenge with Make, give, give, women different, uh, um, give women different bars. I want women of excellence. I want women who go, for, who go for specialities. For instance, if I am training doctors right from first year up to fifth year, I tell them, if you want to become a surgeon, be, be sure that you're going to be, for instance, one surgeon in a hospital. Yeah? And we know you must, make, you must become a family person. Please have two or three children, not ten. Huh? It is it is it is it is like some of those very basic things that we tell women, and in order for them to be women of excellence. And so in politics, um, this is another area which uh, women are, are struggling. One of the things is that it it is harsh. For instance, in, in Uganda, uh, there is, uh, first of all, uh, an area to compete with men, yeah? 
to become a member of parliament before you can become a minister. You really have to compete with a man if you want to be like not a women's, a women's representative, but you must, you want to be a representative, for instance, of a district area. So you must compete on, 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 on equal ground. Because men have, actually men in leadership also face similar challenges, yeah? So, if, if the, the ground is level and you want to be a woman of excellence, try to, try to, to show also, for instance, your mandate, yeah? Show what you're going to, I mean, show the, the electorate what you are capable of, convince them, yeah, convince them in, in your talks, and then uh, walk the talk. Sometimes they say it is, it's easy to have an example. It's easy as a woman to live by example, or as a leader to live by example, but not space. I think um, you want to speak to this, Ooh, yes. Karibu Sana. You look like you're about to explode. Yes. Uh, Talk to me, Nigeria. Talk to me. <laughs> Where to start? <laughs> um, this conversation is usually very fraught because I always just want to hold space to make sure we're not placing an in disproportionate burden on women in a system that is stacked against their existence in the first place. Um, and let me use again, because you mentioned Kenya, and we're seeing it playing out in real time. We have the gender quota to enter elective seats um, to be represent at the county level. We are now seeing that by that existing through a new constitutional dispensation in the last 10 years, that has helped women jump from being just women representatives to actually member of parliament, and in one particular case, the first female governor of a particular patriarchal society, really. So these measures that we end up putting in place to actually try and bring equity are very important to uh, bring into the conversation about saying, asking women to you know, step up to excellence. Because I don't think that's where the problem lies. And earlier in another session, I spoke about being very clear about that the diagnostic of the issue. The informal norms you're speaking about are exactly the diagnostic we need to focus on. And we must be very clear not to make sure that it sounds like it's a women's problem alone. And this is a conversation we're having in my country to the sword, if you will, about how much more, how much more excellence must we show if the system is still stacked against us. The fact that there are women still showing up, going on the campaign trail, being assaulted physically and digitally, um, and still, you know, that we will never probably even understand. You can't even put a data point to what that entails. So sure, a man will be told he's incompetent. Um, is he being assessed based on merit or is he being assessed based on gender? And these can be you know, slippery slopes that we can go into. But even when we bring that to the corporate sector or to the, any other sector beyond politics, because everything is political actually if you think about it, these are the same issues that play out. These are the same p issues that will play out when I'm a black woman in a majority white led institution, right? So there are these things that, how many, how many fights will I put up? <laughs> yeah? How many fights will I put up? So we have to be very careful about placing a disproportionate burden about excellence or about what more women must be asked to give beyond what they're doing. Because until the plane is equal, it is a disproportionate burden being placed on the very people who have been disenfranchised. Absolutely. So we must be very careful about what we're diagnosing, right? And as we are, um, as, as with that statement, I'm just going to come straight to you, Vidisha, right? Because you did mention that this is also um, an issue in the, in the workplace. So as we're thinking about the workplace context, so there was a workplace rep report from McKinsey that they did in partnership with leanin.org. And um, it showed that despite the fact that women leaders stepped up um, to support employee well-being well-being, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts during the pandemic season. Um, their work was largely and hardly ever recognized, leading to great burnout and unfulfillment, right? Because in this time, there, was a lot, there were a lot of women who were stepping up to lead um, with empathy, um, presenting works, um, creating workspaces that allowed their employees to navigate the emotional toil, um, the mental toil of the pandemic. Um, however, um, their leadership skills were not recognized 
recognize because these are not su success metrics for an organization, right? So then where do we start rethinking the models upon which we're building workplaces that leverage and make room for the, e for the unique qualities and leadership skills um, that women can bring to the bottom line? Okay, um, thanks Kalila and thanks Najira for sort of speaking just before me because I'll be building on a lot of what you've said already. Um, to begin with, I want to, I, want to, I want to first kind of explore this idea of men and women bringing some inherently distinct qualities to the workplace because I'm not sure if that is true. Um, of course, we are socialized. Um, women are socialized to perhaps be less confident, uh, apologize more. Men sort of, society lets them be more confident and grow up with a certain sense of entitlement. So I'm sure that we do have certain different qualities. But because, as Nigeria was saying earlier, the structures within which we operate, the institutions that within which we bring in these leadership skills are largely patriarchal, I sometimes feel that women who are in these leadership positions also are not able to um, really operate the way that they would want to operate. Um, in fact, sometimes I feel that there is this added onus on women to be exemplars of feminist leadership within institutions that are not really conducive to those conditions. Um, so yeah, to, to kind of, to your question on how we begin to reimagine or remodel workplaces for new forms of leadership, um, I suppose it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation because you need those strong feminist leaders to be able to really lead the change uh, and then have these workplaces that are able to kind of, uh, that, that support feminist principles to operate. Uh, but at the same time, if you don't have structures that let those feminist leaders thrive, how will that even happen? Um, so that to me is, is, a, is a, an interesting kind of situation that we're all sort of dealing with. I'm not sure if that answers your question. I wanted to briefly also go into some of the enabling factors that, uh, that we keep saying that are required for feminist leadership to thrive. Um, of course, you need great mentors. We, we speak about the importance of having great uh, women mentors uh, or you know, feminist mentors, I would say, because I also find it problematic to keep our conversations within the man-woman binary. Um, because personally, I've had uh, great male mentors in the past. So uh, yes, yeah, so of course, the importance of having those mentors is 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 well recognized. But at the same at the same time, there are certain structural issues that need to be in place that actually have nothing to do with leadership. That just have to do with having a place that allows women to feel safe. Um, it allows women to just do their job without having to worry about anything. Um, an example, and because I work for a health institute, we often quote the 70% number for the health workforce. 70% of the health workforce is women. Um, we know that these women are not in leadership positions. We also know that, um, well, it took the pandemic for us to highlight the fact that a lot of PPE kits were never really designed with women in mind, even though 70% of women in those workplaces, um, yeah, uh, work, have been working and doing their jobs for a very long time. So I suppose just redesigning um, how we think of workplaces, redesigning just some basic functions, uh, keeping women in mind would ultimately lead to those new models that will let uh, leadership for women thrive. Right, and it takes great intentionality to do that because it's not just going to happen with hardcore structures, right? So the question is, you know, individually, as you're thinking about going back to your spaces, how do you keep that top of mind? And then um, how do you think about the resource you'd back behind that? Because there's a lot of mindset shift that needs to happen. So the question is, where do you start? Um, but you start by reflecting, right? Um, I'm, Ephraim, I'm going to jump, jump over to you. Media, content, analog, and digital. Over the years, media, and now digital media, um, has played a key role in driving access to information campaigns um, that build the capacity of girls and women to make key life decisions. And on the flip side, um, it has also played a derogatory role in keeping certain regressive attitudes, norms, and beliefs on the role of women at play, right? Um, by and large, media is business. So hence, what sells is what will take center stage. 
a hundred percent. So how can we rethink our approach in using media in efforts to advance gender, right? Apart from awareness creation, is there a role media can play in transforming the way societies relate to the girl child and women and how she relates with herself and the world around her? Is there space for us to start thinking about, right, um, creating from within? So do we now build um, independent media houses to do what we need, the work needs to be done? Um, let's, um, let me hear your thoughts. Thank you very much, Kalila. And uh, Nottingham, the token of the panel. Um, yeah, I would just like to echo one thing which uh, was said yesterday in, the, in the, uh, the last session yesterday about narratives. The media, the things that we consume, the things, the stories that we tell ourselves, media is a storytelling um, tool. We tell stories to ourselves, we tell stories to others about ourselves or to ourselves about others by the media we interact with and to our future generation about ourselves by the media that we keep. So I, just what can be done, I would uh, like to maybe to echo uh, one thing which uh, the 1995 Beijing Declaration which was very forward thinking. At the time, 1995, when Beijing Declaration was being drafted, um, there wasn't this new media as much. But how it was drafted, it takes into account even the internet right now uh, and, and, and how it has pro proliferated across the world. So one of the aims was to increase the participation and access of women to expression and decision making in and through the media and new technologies of communication and to promote a balanced and non-stereotyped portrayal of women in the media. Since then, uh, this is recent data, I, li I like working with numbers, recent data, um, women make up only 24% of people seen, in, heard, read about in newspapers, television and radio. This is uh, from uh, a statement done by Women uh, uh, International Women uh, Media Foundation, uh, Qatar Center among others last year. Uh, second, 46% of news stories reinforce gender stereotypes, 46%. Of every news stories, they reinforce uh, gender stereotypes, while only 4% clearly challenge these gen gender stereotypes. Only 4%. Uh, women are often portrayed in stereotypical and hypersexualized roles. Women, um, in this uh, same, same kind of data set, 20% of experts interviewed are women, 80% are men. 73% uh, of management jobs occupied are in, in the media institutions are occupied by men compared to 27 percent occupied by women so yes to answer your question there's no one size fit all it's a two-pronged approach getting change from ch change from within from management from directorship role from pushing this and then also creating new safer spaces which uh, um, are specifically targeted towards local um, uh, communities that want that, com that, that, that kind of uh, uh, technology, be it traditional media versus uh, digital media. I'll give a very specific example, and maybe Nigeria can back me on this. In Kenya, when we switched over from um, uh, analog to digital, uh, there was a new push for radio stations, for television stations, which um, everyone can come and it's much easier right now to invest in that and to get frequency. It's, it's cheaper but not the best best but it's a bit cheaper compared to how it was pre us moving to, to digital and there are specific channels, be it radio, be it television, in Kenya that are geared towards consumption of children, women, among others. So creating such kind of spaces and also changing the ones that exist because this, the media's expression is what we tell ourselves. We tell stories, this is how our children and our great-grandchildren are going to remember us, by the stories we tell ourselves, by the story, stories we tell others about ourselves, and by the stories we consume to ourselves about others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for that data. In case any, I, I have a feeling some, some of us learned something that we didn't know. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Create new spaces while you're changing the ones that exist. 100%. Now over to you, Nanjira. When it comes to um, creating, I, I, I love how you segued into creating safe spaces, right? Um, the gender equality movement has seen its fair share of programs, projects, interventions, intervention galore. I'm pretty sure um, uh, 
some of, all of us can think about some interventions that we have come across. Um, and, and, and they've been there to build and strengthen the capacity of the girl, child, and women, and in general, really to allow them to, to thrive, right? So from sexual reproductive health education, access to finance, health education, extensive list. Um, but despite all these efforts, marginal improvements have been made right, globally, um, especially in the global south. Enter the pandemic and then the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we, are, we have been set back substantially. Now, what can we do to, as we're thinking about these areas? Because the fact of the matter is we have to, as we're thinking about bouncing forward, it's leapfrog. So how can we reframe how we think about intervention design and the approaches that we're using? Is there we're only going to address gender-based violence um, online or offline once we have data points? So um, that has led, for example, to a situation where the Kenya police, for example, are supposed to be oh God, launching an app where if you are a threat of gender-based violence as a woman, you're supposed to grab your phone, eh? uh -huh. grab your phone, record, record yourself, being record yourself being beaten. And that's supposed to activate and go to the police station. The very police station where if you go and you report with all the bruises and all, they're going to ask you what you did that the man or whoever was violating you did. We need to sit with the trouble. And I really want to target this, especially to development practitioners who are trying to come into the continent specifically. Very tied to that as a side note, please let one Kigali dialogue outcome be the death of the term Sub-Saharan Africa. We are one continent. There's no sub up down there. There aren't, please. I beg of thee. But back to, the, back to the issue. Sitting with the trouble will allow us to understand that our little interventions in the spheres we understand need to be connected to the bigger issue. So you will work on one issue. I will work on, she's going to teach the medical students. I'm going to work on the technology space. Somebody else is going to work on this, that, or the other. And we need to find spaces for those who say are doing intervention. To, we need to federate the headache back upwards to you. Why are you intervening the way you are? Is it because of the age old practices of capacity building for capacity building sake where all that money pretty much just circulates in the same circuit? Is it actually ending up on so-called ground where these um, issues are supposed to happen? And another thing I've seen in some communities um, across Africa now happening is the conversation of can you keep only investing on so-called girl child in the developmental sense without actually dealing with the place of the fact that patriarchy is also not serving men. Patriarchy only serves you if you're rich. So where do we have the space that makes sure that the man who's going to meet out his frustration on his wife because he could not earn a living, or in Kenya, a new phenomenon we started talking about where men disappear for 50 years and when they're older, they come back home. Can you imagine being ghosted for 50 years? The man left one day, he said, I've gone like this, I'll be right back. But because he has so much stress, he leaves his family in that disenfranchisement. Where are those mechanisms to support that? And I'm not saying this is a dichotomy or a, you know, a, a zero-sum game. If we do not sit with the trouble, we'll keep misdiagnosing the issue. But now we are getting to a place where I keep saying, this decade especially, we're living at the time where we have kicked all the cans down the road. And we are meeting them. So any intervention you're going to keep designing, Please remember that you have to take account for what has worked and more importantly, what has not. Because we can't keep just iterating the next du jour, de rigueur, whatever vibration of the day. These are serious lives we're dealing with, and especially when it comes to this continent. I think too long now, we've not had policymakers who stepped up and said enough of this experimenting with our lives and you know tinkering with us i mean you have some development practitioners who will do rb testing on whether this one was bitten or whether this one wasn't what kind of nonsense is that we've gotten into so if we do not sit with the trouble it's not going to be blockchain it's not going to be i don't know which new invention is being cooked up somewhere sometimes even the most what did you say um leapfrogging or the most uh, um, transformative issues sitting with the trouble and actually having a proper diagnostic because what that will require us to do is when a government comes in to power we have to start pushing for a moral imperative do not use funds that are supposed to get girls you know sanitary pads to enrich yourself what kind of, we have not made that a moral conundrum right because 
until we start doing that, whether it's in governments, whether it's development practitioners, whether it's private sector with their CSR, we are going to keep having gendered issues treated as patchwork um, attempts, rather than seeing it for the systemic mess that it is. Sit with the trouble. Sit with the trouble. All right. I, I am very passionate about education, and especially education of girls. Uh, one of the things that I see is, is that uh, at policy level, there are, many, uh, there are many discussions there. Sometimes I wonder whether these discussions are really by uh, real people, because we see even feminists are part of this discussion. And for instance, when you come up with a, a, a policy to, to improve women's or girls' education, by saying you will give 1.5, this is in Uganda, they will add you 1.5 points to enable you access higher education. In this way, you are addressing a, a problem, but you are really far removed from the problem. You, 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 you actually uh, want to define only the symptom, or you want to deal with the symptom. Women or girls are not coming to the university because, because they lack this 1.5 point, yeah? There, there, there are many systemic issues. There are many uh, gendered issues. For instance, at home, if someone is sick, the girl will stay home, the boy will go to school. I know of some schools whereby, because they want to protect the girls, it is a mixed school, because they want to protect the girls, they will tell the girls to the boys will stay to read a little more. They, they are protecting the girls. And they do it in good faith. They, they, are, they explain for you and you think it is logical, right? But like very uh, small steps will, will lead to a bigger, a bigger outcome. So yes, I agree with you. Systemic issues need to be yeah, addressed. Is right, and as we're thinking about solutions, it's not necessarily just about involving the community as informants. We need to involve communities in the design process as well, because they're, they're, they're key in, in um, they're key, they understand the problems. They've set with it. I was going to say, in fact, the, because capacity building has been mentioned, I was about to start a drinking game on capacity building. Um, the problem with how we are thinking about it is we see communities, and especially what we imagine as pure, poor communities, um, as illiterate, and it's always tied to literacy, but we always forget that they're, they're experts of their lived experience. The humility we have to take on to go and sit, you know, if you're saying you want, ask. Don't come with your pre-built solution from on high in an air-conditioned room. And now, you know, the problem on the continent is I think we're getting to a place where people have learned to just say the same thing because I know you're coming in and you say you're an NGO, I must say capacity build me. Absolutely, because you're going to give me that That's brown envelope. Reached, exactly. Brown envelope with five dollars and I go to home get your quick money. Happy. All right, thank you so much, Nanjira. We're going to open it up to the audience. Um, I'll receive three questions. Um, keep them. Do we have any hands? Do we have any hands? I, I see one, I see two, I see three. Any hands on this side? None. Um, and one back there, so we'll just quickly take the four and then come back. Can we take all four at the same time? Sure. Yes, awesome. Um, I'd love you to stand up and take your space. Um, your name, where you're from, um, directly to the question. Um, this is that panel where you cannot am, sit down and I ask I am it. from Afghanistan, and this panel, it was about the, from DC to Afghanistan. I just want to ask, uh, Okay, I'm not going to repeat what happened to us. You know very well that what happened to us, to Afghan women, and today what is going on in Afghanistan, it is gender apartheid, and unfortunately the world and the international community is so silent. Those who created many project agendas about to save Afghan women. So, from our 20 years experience that we have in Afghanistan, and we lost everything, almost everything, um, it is somehow also question and somehow also suggestion for those countries that women, they, they have, they are fighting for their basic rights still, okay. The most and the significant and the most important and the most significant thing that women in this country should, should have, it is access to education. 
we should as much as we can we should invest in girls education and we should give our girls this opportunity to discover themselves by themselves and to discovering ourselves it is not a short-term project it is not just two years or four years it is a process and process is not coming just within few years it is a life process so please whoever you have any 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 power any any possibility under any kind of project just encourage women to go to a, to have an education and also do not forget men educated women is a very dangerous weapon for uneducated men so uneducated man tries to use his stu stupidity to kill the educated woman so then you come with a new solution and please the second have a plan b because nobody will save you they will betray you they will leave you they even don't care about you wow there we go okay. directly to you on teen pregnancies um Okay, so I am under a lot of pressure just to seeing that. Um, I'll try to be as articulate. Yeah, try to be as articulate as possible. Um, so yeah, on the the technology question, as we explored in that paper, and then as we've heard over the last couple of days as well, I suppose the first step is who's designing these technologies. Um, you know, the reason that we have these patriarchal technologies at the moment is because a lot of the designers are people who want those sex dolls. Um, you know, so essentially that is, the, that is really the first step. We, we, we start from there. Um, on the, there was also a question on gender and class, and I just wanted to kind of chime in there and talk about intersectionality. That's really wh where we're all sort of focusing on at the moment because we do recognize that there are a lot of power asymmetries even within different gender groups. Um, on, on the question on, um, on the advice to governments, um, that's a tough one for me because um, as we've been talking about so far um, lived experiences are really that are most valuable so i find myself uncomfortable um, talking about things that uh, i have not closely experienced in that way so i would actually pass that on to someone else on the panel who could maybe tackle that so this concept gender was uh, conceived uh, in the early 70s, let's say. And the main, uh, the main uh, objective was to analyze the position of women in politics, in, in economically, or what they're doing in education, major spheres, ownership of property, and whether what they do is valued. And the conclusion was uh, many women, the majority of women, are in the, in the private sphere. They are doing uh, everyday activities, essential activities, important activities, including caregiving. But these, uh, these activities are not remunerated. They are not valued. They are in the private sphere. They are not even assessed like what economic value can you give to caregiving? Yeah, I have colleagues who have for, to ask for, who have asked for for leave to attend to a chronically ill, and after two years, the 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 person is different. You are thinking differently. You you've lost uh, track of what is in academia. You want to start uh, like from scratch, attending to what is a modern literature. And, and so on. But you've been doing something which is very crucial for a society. Let's also give an example of giving birth. And I am very sympathetic uh, uh, about the issue of teenage uh, pregnancy. But I don't want to have, for instance, a student doctor with a child in class and, and pretend that I am teaching and this, this woman is understanding what, what I'm teaching 
in the board meeting, I said, this lady has given birth, give her a year off. Yeah? Give her a year off, especially if they have no alternative child care giving. Because this is also a crucial aspect in women's life. So let, uh, let, uh, and in relation to what you're asking about, so this child whom you're giving, the mother whom you're giving technology, a computer to work with, or you are training and skilling in computer uh, aspects and digital technology. What do you expect at the end? Do you really think they are paying enough attention to utilize this technology? Let us also be practical and not demand too much. Already child caregiving is 24 hour. And how can you attend to, how can you assume this woman is, is absorbing this information in your class? Okay, and then the Afghan women. I'm quite sympathetic. In fact, many, many, uh, many, in many ways, they call it great, great regression. While others are only talking about regression, but you, you, you have great regression. But don't, romant, romant, don't romanticize education either. For instance, we have an example now whereby we have uh, Swedish women struggling with caregiving. Yeah? Uh, over 60% of Swedish women are very well educated. But when they asked for uh, maternity leave and they were given four months, they needed extra help. Like men also go for paternity leave. They didn't want, and this one is on record. Why is that so? These tasks which you are sending men to do are not what, what they want to do. It is undervalued. It is not uh, essential in, 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 in the public sphere. And it calls for backlash, or it causes backlash even for the men. So how can we romanticize education, and to what extent is education really empowering women. That's why I have reached a level where I want to attend to women's needs. And they are varied. Women, have, women are varied by class, by culture, mm. by religion. Absolutely. And if a woman doesn't want to attain uh, up to highest level of education, who am I to to keep telling her, Attain, go to class, go to class, go to class. What if she wants to do uh, hot culture, where, whereby she just stays in one, in one area and she's happy with that? What, what if she wants to, to, to be a caregiver? Brilliant, so yeah? basically creates those interventions that yeah. really look into context. Yes. Perfect. Um, if we're in perhaps your